Well, Job chapter 32. Job 32, and this morning we're going to spend some time. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so. (laughs) There's a lot in Job, let me just say that. There's a lot in Job. And uh, you could you could spend an eternity just studying the book of Job, and it seems like we have. But you know, at the same time, uh, the way we study the Bible, though, um, tell you the truth, we do spend a lot of time in one book. It seems like Pastor spent, I think he said, five years in Revelation. But at, in the same time, we're going through one book. We're going through all the Bible, all the chain references, all the cross references. So, and, and the way uh, we, we believe that this is the best way to study a Bible uh, in a group sense and even in your own personal sense um, because you get the whole counsel of God. All right, you get the, the Bible is profitable for doctrine. We point out the doctrine, Right. We understand that there's things in the Old Testament doctrinally that do not apply to us as Christians, and we point those things out. Why? Because you know, you say, well, if they're not, if they don't apply to us, why? What's the, why bother with them? Because there are people in this world and in other churches, other religions that use our Bible in verses that don't apply doctrinally and try to apply them doctrinally, and that's how people get messed up. So it's important to go to those things, and then we also look at. Uh, the historical aspect of what's going on. That's important to understand historically where things are, what, what's happening, why you're, where you're reading that. And then obviously, the scripture that's profitable for do- not only doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness so that we can get some help in this age. Uh, we don't throw out the Old Testament because uh, it's the Old Testament. Amen? Uh, the Bible clearly tells us God clearly instructed us that the old thing, the Old Testament, the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through patience, <laughs> and you have to have patience when you're going through the Bible like this, amen? Patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have what? Hope. Amen? And we need some hope in this day and age. Badly. Amen? And so, here in Job chapter 32, uh, this, this more we'll start reading... Um, We'll read real quickly from verse 1, but we're not going to cover. We covered all the way down to verse 6, I believe. So we're just going to read quickly just to kind of get our bearings. Then we'll get into verse 6. It says, So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Very important phrase. Then when, then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. Again, he didn't curse God, as Satan had tried to get him to, but he didn't justify God. He justified himself. And also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. We just went through 30 verses almost of a bunch of fellas that threw a bunch of accusations at Job and had no evidence. You're going to accuse somebody, make sure you have evidence. Back it up. And it says here, verse 4, Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. Elihu getting angry. I mean, if you had a name like Elihu, amen, you just need to get angry every once in a while. (laughs) But it says here in verse 6, And Elihu, well, and... As we see here, just real quickly in in these verses, these verses 4 and 5, we understand that Elihu, even though uh, he is getting ready to to say some things uh, that may be out of place in some people's minds, and especially these three guys, I'm sure it is out of place in their mind, and even Job maybe, he did follow the proper protocol. He did follow uh, the right path and, and... Allowing these guys to speak. He didn't just jump in and, you know, butt in. Uh, you know, we, we need to teach our children to be as respectful as Elihu is. Amen? 
Boy, oh boy, it's, it's amazing how kids nowadays just uh, seem to think it's okay when two adults are talking just to run up and, 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 and start blabbing and, and interrupt the conversation. Uh, when I was young, if I did that. Uh, and we looked at last week um, how not only is Elihu showing the proper uh, honor to these elder gentlemen, but Elihu is also... He is like a good like a good lawyer is is listening to the facts first. He is listening to every bit of conversation. He's waiting, waiting for these three guys to just all right. Somewhere along the line, they're going to pull out something and they're going to prove that Job is a liar and he's just he just doesn't get it. And he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting and nothing. And Elihu's just, he's just dumbfounded at how these guys can just spew, I mean, just constantly spew out these, these arguments and have no backup whatsoever, have nothing to back up what they're saying. And, and it makes him mad, it makes him angry. But he's smart enough, he's smart enough to wait, wait the thing out, look at the whole, the situation as a whole, back up, see the whole picture, and not answer a matter, amen, uh, before he heareth it. As the book of Proverbs in 18 verse 13 says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. How many times, that, you know, we walk up on a conversation maybe midstream, and, 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 you know, we make a fool of ourselves because we butt in with some, some you know, some responses or some advice that has nothing to do with what's going on. We think we got the whole picture when we just heard a little bit, and we've got all the answers. And Elihu, he didn't do that. He didn't operate that way. He walked upon this scene. He heard that all the stuff that had gone on with Job, and just like these three guys, no doubt, came to mourn with Job, to comfort him. That's what their intent was. I'm not, I don't doubt that whatsoever. Uh, but as, as, uh, as they sat and they looked at the situation... They answered the matter before they heard the whole story. They're going to hear the whole story (laughs) later. But right now, Elihu, he didn't do that. He walked up on the scene as well, no doubt, and and, uh, just in sympathy with Job. uh, But then this whole conversation began. And so he sent by God, no doubt, to, uh, to mediate the situation. Is doing doing his job, and he says in verse, the Bible says in verse sixteen, and Elihu the son of Rachel, the, the Buzite answered and said, "I am young, and ye are very old." <laughs> Amen. I don't think he meant that in any disrespect. Amen. I believe he was uh, just make just pointing it out, and he says, "And wherefore I was afraid, and durst not show you mine opinion." All right. Now there's there's uh, I don't think Eli he was a wimp here. He's he's made the statement that he was afraid. It, in other words, he was he had the proper fear in the sense that you know he he put his fear in the proper perspective that these men are elder than me. They've got the experience. No doubt they're going to have the answers. No doubt they're going to be able to see the situation and they're going to be able to, uh, to 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 help Job and give him the proper advice. Because they've been around a while. That's the rule. Typically, that's what happens. Most of the time, the older fellows in, the, in, the, in a situation understand, what, understand what's going on. And young people, they, they just don't seem to get it. They think because they've you know, read it on the internet, they've watched it on television, uh, they've, 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 you know, they're... they're um, their peers, their friends have, have already given them the lowdown, and they've got all the answers. And so they, they, you know, they don't hear anything an adult says. It's, an adult sounds like, you know, Charlie Brown, the person on the phone. Wah, 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 wah. They hear what we're saying audibly, but they're not hearing what we're saying. And you can tell because they don't take the advice. And their lives get destroyed because they will not listen to the advice of an elder person that has been around a while, that has made the mistakes already, and they decide, well, if they made the mistakes, 
They turned out all right. I'll make the mistakes and I'll turn out all right. No, it doesn't always work out that way. I'm sorry, it doesn't. Elihu had the proper perspective. He said, somebody that's been around a while, I'm going to sit back and listen because they're old. Amen? Not being disrespectful, it's just the way it is. They're very old. I'm very young, so I'm going to listen. And in this, uh, in this class, we've got a, a, a wide spectrum. Amen? We've got some, some young people. Amen? All the way to some... Uh, older people. Amen? So this is, uh, this is good advice. Pay attention to, to Elihu. When you go through your Bible, don't only uh, read exa- you know, what's on the surface, but look at the people. Look at how they act. Look at ho- and, and how God uses them and see what their attitudes are towards things in life. And you'll get a, you'll get a you, you know, you say, well, I, I just didn't, I wasn't brought up. I had a broken home. I, I, you know, blah, blah, blah. Listen, if you're saved and you got a book, you got no excuse. Sorry. No excuse. God has give, put you in a place in a local church where there's people around that can give you advice, take the scriptures, open them up to you. And, and God, the Holy Spirit himself, will work a work in your heart. I don't care what background you have. Pastor's a prime example. Amen. Look at his background. But God put him, put him amongst some, some men of God and some, uh, some uh, ladies of God. Amen. That, that molded his life and made him into the man he is today. And so we, under, we need to understand when we read our Bible that when we go through and we meet people like Elihu, how they operated and learned from it. He said, I, was, I am young and you are very old, wherefore I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. He said, I, I, in verse 7, I said, days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. He's showing the honor that he should to men older than he, even though these men are not showing themselves to be honorable. You're going to run across people that don't deserve it, that don't deserve uh, respect. But before you decide that, <laughs> and and and... There's times when you, you know, as we're going to see, we're going to see an event where you have to overstep those, those, those boundaries. But be careful before you do. Elihu was very careful before he decided to interject what, what, what's on his heart. You're going to run into people that, don't, that have no, uh, no, shouldn't have any respect whatsoever. But because of their age, make sure you, you're very careful before you, uh, before you enter, enter, enter that, uh, that conversation in the way that, that, that needs to be entered. Levit- Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32. In the law, the Bible tells us, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. Amen. That's, uh, that's, that's something that's lacking these days. Uh, the, the respect when someone older comes in the room, uh, young people should, should get up literally. I'm not talking, you say, well, that's just, you, you, wh- how are you going to apply that spiritually? I'm not, I want to say literally get up. Amen. If you're in a seat, get up and get out of the way. Let them sit down. Amen. Be respectful to older people. That's, that's biblical. That, that didn't change with the age of grace. Amen. <laughs> uh, that's something that is, is timeless. He says uh, in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 1, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. So, as we know, that's the rule. There's exceptions to the rule. We're getting ready to see one here in a minute. But the rule is, give honor to whom honor is due. Amen? He says in verse 8, Again, verse 7, I, I said, Days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Elihu, after pointing out that he has followed the proper pro- protocol and allowing these men who had the advantage of years, apparently, and should have had greater wisdom than he, 
he's going to say what they need, to, and, and, and actually, they should have said uh, uh, different, obviously, than what they did. Elihu is now going to explain why he will take it upon himself to rebuke and correct these guys, these three men, and Job, for that matter. You know, too many, um, <clears throat> with, having said all what we just said about the rule of how to respect elders, this is the exception. And too many young men of God have been deceived and their ministries made into a sham because they didn't have the wisdom of Elihu, okay? And they allowed older, godly, good, godly men, quote-unquote, to talk them out of their faith in the perfect words of God. All right? So, the rule is, we need to respect our elders, we need to give honor to whom honor is due, we need to listen to men that have been around a while and, and, and glean from their experience. But, as Elihu said, but, there's a spirit in man. The, the, one of the most perfect illustrations of this is in 1 Kings chapter 13. Turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 13. Men, some men, and I'm not blanketing all schools, all uh, ministries in this, in this statement, but there are some men, and there are a lot of them, unfortunately, that have used their age, their, their position, to maybe not intentionally, some of them probably, because they're false prophets and workers of the devil, and no doubt there it's intentional. But, but for the most part, the, those in our ranks, in our uh, circles, if you will, uh, not intentionally, but because of their position, because of their age, they have used that as an advantage, and they have destroyed the lives of, some, of, of, of God's men that he's called into the ministry because they have, just have robbed them of their faith in the word of God. 1 Kings chapter 13, we're going to read this chapter because this is the prime example of what's going on in these, uh, these Bible colleges that, uh, that push not only, they may not push new versions, people. They may not say, you know, we believe that this version is a better version. They don't have to. You say, well, I think, um, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 the college that uh, I go to or I came out of or blah, 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 they didn't, they didn't push these other versions. But I guarantee you, m the majority of them still don't believe this book is the perfect word of God. And they won't tell you it is, or they'll tell you it is from the pulpit. that when they get in the classroom, they'll take it from you. They're liars. Point blank. And this is an example here in 1 Kings chapter 13 says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Here is somebody that's called of God, that is a man of God. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon the now that is very significant. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but this 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 prophecy that he's getting ready to he talks about Josiah here. That's like it's it's amazing because he is uh, three hundred years before Josiah is even born, and God gives him not only just a, there's going to be a man that's going to do this, but here's his name. I don't think three hundred years down the line somebody had it. Okay, now it's time we're going to name our baby Josiah. And then he's just going to happen to be a king. No, that's not. <laughs> this is God. God's all over this guy is what I'm trying to say. This is a man of God. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense. And upon thee and men's bones shall be burned upon thee. It takes place. It really does. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. 
And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him, and his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. And the altar was also rent. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So it came to pass, just as the prophet said. These guys that call themselves prophets today, you know, and in Muhammad, you know, and all these yahoos that seem to uh, think they can prophesy, uh, if they can, they, they ought to be able to re- reproduce this. And this doesn't happen. They give you some generalities of, you know, the sun's going to come up tomorrow, you know. I'm a prophet. Uh, and the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored to me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. He was, I mean, this guy had it together. He was, he wouldn't take a bribe. He wouldn't take a gift. I mean, the king's offering, I mean, well, he didn't offer him, but he, this prophet said, if you, if you would give me half your kingdom, half your house, I still wouldn't do it. Why? He's got some integrity about him. He's a young man of God that started out right. Look on. For so was it charged me, verse 9, by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way, and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel. And now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. Here's an old man. Someone that had some respect in Bethel. Someone that had some, you know, had some years behind him, had some experience in the ministry. No doubt had a good family. Amen. Looked, he, he, he had a, a good work. Very old, an old man. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king... Then they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen that way the man of God went, which came from Judah. And then these old, these old timers and, and some of these guys in these, these uh, colleges, they see these young men, they see, they see promise in them. And they, they know that, they, man, if they could just get their hands on them, they could mold them and they could, you know, get another notch in their belt because they're going to be under their ministry. They're going to be able to promote their school. They want to get these guys. Verse 13, And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon. And went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread, nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord. Again, don't miss that. The word of the Lord, that thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. And and these guys, they, they, they get these young men. And they said, you know, they, they, they butter him up with, you know, boy, you're doing a great work. <laughs> And, and he's buttering this guy up, and he's saying, Boy, I heard, I've heard about you. I've heard the stuff that you're doing. Boy, God's really using you. And he said, Come home. And the guy says, No, the, the Bible specifically says, Amen, the Word of God says such and such, and I can't. Verse 18. And he said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And an angel, uh oh, an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. And that's what they're doing day after day is lying to these guys, telling them, Listen, you can, uh, you can teach the Bible, 
uh, and, 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 you know, you need to get up behind the pulpit and make sure you proclaim the King James Bible's word of God, but your people don't really understand it because they don't know the original languages. They may not promote a new version, like I said, but they're going to tell the, their people, they're, they're going to teach these men, and, and listen, these guys are sincere. They fall for it. All right? They're sincere. They think that they're doing the right thing. All right? They think they're teaching the Word of God the correct way by going in deeper into the old languages that most of us can't even fathom these languages. And they're not even going into the languages. They're going to somebody else's translation of this language, whether it's a new version or not, or some, some concordance, some, some Greek, uh, Greek dictionary. And they're taking some other guy's translation of the same word that the translators of the King James Bible had, and they put it this way, and they're saying... It could be this way. Or they'll take, take you to some other places in the King James Bible where God led the King James translator to translate the word this way for a specific reason. God doesn't do anything without reason. Right? And they'll take you to those verses where the words are different and they'll say, see, this word could be translated this way. And it may be a totally different meaning, totally different context, and that's why God had the King James translator put it in that way. And they get people all confused, and they think, well, well, if, if that's the better meaning of, my, of this word, this Hebrew word, if that's the better meaning, then why didn't they translate it this way then? And immediately put doubt into these guys' mind on what? This book. That this is the word of God. And that's the same thing. That's Satan's M.O. That's what he's done from the beginning. Yea hath God said. There doesn't have to be a big push for a new version. Alright. We know that the, the liberals and the, and the, and the, the, the neo-evangelicals and the... And the, and the uh, the, the charismatics and all the, the modern day liberal mega church Christianity, they're, they're gone. They're totally gone because they've got these other versions. But in our circles, people, there's people that are being, robbed, the word of God is being robbed from them right under their noses and they don't even understand it. You say, Brother Tony, you, you seem to be very passionate about this this morning. I am. Like you like, it makes me angry. But he lied unto him. That's all they're doing is lying. And it, all it is is to make, the, make the, the, uh, the, the student come up with a way to make himself higher than the people so that he knows more. Listen, there, there may be, an, there, there is, a, obviously there are people in the pews that don't study their Bible. Amen. That don't understand the Bible. Maybe they're just saved. Don't, don't understand it. That the, uh, a preacher should know more. Amen. Knowledge of the book. But they can. But the, the, the message that we give you is that you can have as much knowledge as you want. It's here. It's in your lap. Amen. It's not up here in this head. It's in your lap. You have the word of God. If you don't know it, that's your fault. Amen? Now, it, hopefully, people are in uh, churches that are pushing the Word of God, and, and people are getting it. But where, they're, where they are, uh, praise God for them. But he lied unto them. Verse 19 of 1 Kings 13. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. He said, an angel... He didn't say, remember when, when the word of God came to the young prophet, he knew it. He said, the, the, thus saith the Lord. The word of the Lord says, this old prophet said, an angel told me that the word of the Lord says. Well, we know. Who can be transformed into an angel? Satan. Amen. Who, who, got, uh, who, who uh, started this, uh, this cult on uh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist and, and Mormonism? 
some nut job that think, thought an angel came down or said an angel came down and told him. He's a liar. One of two things. Either an angel did come down and tell him, and most likely he did. I wouldn't, I'm not doubting Satan's power. I wouldn't doubt it for one minute that Joseph Smith saw an angel. And he got some, some revelation and, and sent millions of people to hell because of it. And he, he, he stopped trusting this as the final authority. And they'll come to your house and they'll tell you, listen, they'll, they'll, and they'll tell you the King James only. The King James Bible is, is it. They, won't, they don't push any other version. But an angel told me, <laughs> had two guys come to my house and they said, uh, uh, you know, dress real nice, real respectful looking young men. And the kids are wondering, who, who, who is this? <laughs> and I said, uh, <laughs> I guarantee you who it is. They're Mormons. And then they came to the door and they, and they, they tried to, you know, they, they, their, their MO now is not to... Uh, uh, try to give you their information. Their MO now is, is to, the, the age that we live in is polls and elections and all this stuff. Now they're taking surveys. And they ask these questions. They want to take a survey. And the questions, their questions are, you know, you know if, do, do you think what's going on in the world today is, is, is tragic? <laughs> Who wouldn't? And would you like to live in a better place? Oh, Yeah. And then they eventually get around, you know, and, and, I, and we saw right through it. And I, and I said, listen, guys, I said, there's, there's no need to go any further. I answered their questions. I said, I'll, I'll be glad to answer your questions. I said, but I want to tell you something. Your church, your uh, founder is leading you, and, and if you continue down this path, you're going to wind up in hell for eternity. And they got, you know, defensive naturally. And they said, listen, uh, you know, uh, they started spewing all their, their, their history. And I said, I know your history. An angel told your prophet what to tell you, what, for, for, what, for you to tell me. I said, but Paul, in the King James Bible that you promote... Paul said, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than what, than what we have preached, and it's already written down, there's not going to be another one. Paul said it then. It was done, settled. Let him be accursed. I said, your prophet was accursed. That angel, whatever angel told him was accursed. And I said, and you're cursed right now. Unless you trust Jesus Christ and what's written in this book, you're going to go to hell. And they kindly disagreed and, and went on their way. But that's what's happening in this passage here. That's what's happening in a, in a sense in these colleges. And that's obviously what's happened with, with cults. There's, there's, there's a reason why there's, uh, there's so many different cults and things going on and things being taught that are contrary to the word of God. Because some angel spoke up and somebody bought it. Or some kid died and went to heaven, and he's got some book now telling people how what heaven's like. Listen, though we are an angel from heaven, preach anything under, uh, any other gospel unto you than what we have preached, let him be accursed. It's not, unless it's out of this book, it's not God's word. Bottom line. I don't care how much it lines up. Satan is, Satan is slick, man. He'll, he'll, he'll get as close to this book as he possibly can. He's not going to, uh, he didn't start out with, you know, uh, the living translation. He started out with, yea, hath God said, just putting the doubt in. Little, little here, little there. And then it's turned out to be, you know, what, you know, 300 translations a, a day, a year or whatever, uh, different. That's an exaggeration, of, obviously, but, but he didn't start out just throwing out a new version he slipped in softly through the back door. Waving the King James Bible, saying this is the word of God. But, 
<clears throat> Elihu says, but there is a spirit of man. So back to our, in 1 Kings chapter 13. So, the, uh, so he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drink water. And it came to pass, as they sat at the table, that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet and that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Oh, oh now he's going to start quoting scripture. Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink no water, thou, thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. And it came to pass, after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way, and the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, and the lion standing by the carcass. And they came and told him the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient unto the word of the Lord. So these guys will sit up in their colleges, still Baptist. Amen. Still waving the King James Bible and advertising that it's the word of God and say and see these young men going liberal and, 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 and ruining their ministries. And they'll, boy, that's a shame. When they're the cause of it. It's disgusting. What a sad story. I mean, you know, this whole story goes all the way to the end. You can read it, finish it on your own. We're not going to finish it for sake of time this morning, but what a sad, sad story in your Bible. And God, no doubt, just as God sent the lion spirit to the prophets of Ahab, amen, to get them all messed up, will send, you know, we've, 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 we've come to a point in America where God is saying, you want... A lie, I'll give it to you. And he allows the, this stuff to go on. God could stop it. But he allows it to go on because people don't want the truth. Sad, very sad. Elihu says back in our text, Job chapter 32, but there is a spirit in man. Everyone born into this world is born as a trichotomy, a three-part being. Look at, um, you're in Job there, turn over to one chapter, verse 4, chapter 33 and verse 4. The Bible says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. Notice how it went from let us create our into let, so God created man in his. God is a three part being. Amen. We're not going to go into study the whole, the whole study of the Trinity right here. But God, we know God is a three-part being. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God made man in his image. So if God made man in, in his image, how did he make him? Well, go to chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. All right? He made him out of something tangible. Something physical you can grab onto. He formed him. He gave him a form. A tabernacle, if you will. A, a, a vessel. <laughs> and he put something in the vessel. Formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Inspiration. You want a definite, definition of inspiration? There it is. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And so man has got a form, a tabernacle, a, a piece of a, a vessel of clay, 
I mean, you take dust and you put, you know, I mean, I like, I, kids make mud pies, you know. I don't want to know what they use to make them. But uh, I don't know whether it's, you know, and remember when in the, in, the, in the Gospels when Christ made that clay to put on that guy's eyes? What was the Bible said he did? He spit in it. Amen? Now, mind you, this is God Almighty. When God spits in something, it's pretty good. When he spit in that ground back there in the Garden of Eden, he got up a bunch of dirt, amen, a bunch of dust of the ground. You ever try to do something with dust? It doesn't work. What you got to do, you got you to get it wet. You got to make it, you know, formable. That's what God did. He spit in the ground, amen? Just like he spit in that, uh, the ground and made clay for that man's eyeballs. <clears throat> when God made that clay, he was making eyeballs, amen? <clears throat> when God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. After he made that form, made that, 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 that shell, that tabernacle, that vessel, he says, I need to put something in the vessel. And he breathed in his nostrils and inspired Adam. Adam was an inspired being. And when he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, you don't see breath, amen? It's, 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 uh, you, you breathe on a window, you see the, the effects of it, but you don't see it, amen? That spirit went inside of Adam, and then he became a living soul. And so... We know that a soul is, you can see a soul. John saw him up in heaven. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. Remember what he said? He didn't see the spirits of them. You can't see a spirit. He saw the souls of them that were beheaded. You can see a soul. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And most of you know these verses. Pastor's been over this a number of times. But uh, it's a good to get in remem- remembrance of them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul confirms man's trichotomy. Here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. So if a Christian is whole, if a person is going to be whole, this is what they have to be. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul. All right? They're not the same. Don't let anybody tell you that, oh, that's just a different, you know, spirit, soul, you know, they're all, they're, they're, no, they're not the same. They're spelled different for one thing. Spirit and soul and body. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a whole being, what are you? Three parts. Your spirit, your soul, and your body. Just like God. A whole being. One being, three parts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Alright? Look at First uh, uh, John chapter 1. Our text is, there is a spirit in man. Well, sure there is. In John chapter 1. Every man is born into this world. Every person is born in this world a three-part being. John chapter 1. Got to hurry. John chapter 1. I'm going to start reading verses. If you don't get to them, just listen closely. Talking about the light, look at verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth how many? Every man that cometh into the world. All right? Every man that comes into the world gets, gets the light. All right? The light's connected with God Almighty, Jesus Christ. All right? The Holy Spirit of God. Every man is, so Calvin, if, if he's right, then everybody's saved and is going to go to heaven anyway, so don't worry about it. But something happens. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Something happens that causes an individual to be defective. <laughs> Amen? Defective. Every person's born in sin. I'm not saying every person is born perfect. They still have that sin nature. 
But every one of them have a live spirit when they're born. That can be debated, but let's, let's just read on. Romans chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, all right, sin used God's law to what? Taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. Paul said there was a time in my life when I was alive without the law. He's not talking about now. He's talking about prior to something. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and what? I died. All right, Paul's not talking about a physical death. He's not talking about his soul dying, because that would mean he was in hell for all eternity. That's the second death, right? He's, so what is he talking about that died? His spirit died. He was alive without the law once. He was a baby. Didn't know sin, wasn't, a, made, wasn't held accountable for sin. Now, you can argue that the, the spirit's still dead. They're just not held accountable for it. Whatever. But Paul said, I'm just telling you what Paul said. He was alive without the law once. <clears throat> for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Hurrying right along. I want to get these verses in before we close. <laughs> I know we'll be back next week. Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He's not talking about people that had come up from the grave physically. He's not talking to zombies. I know the world's infatuated with zombies. Hey Amen. We were talking about we went to Cabela's yesterday and they got real bullets for zombies. People. They're, 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 there's, there's some really stupid people in this world that are fall for that stuff. And, they, and, and I know some people probably buy it as a joke. Oh, that's cool. But some people bought them and bought a ton of them because they thought that they needed them to stop the zombies. There may be needing them to stop something, but it's not going to be a zombie, okay? There, there might be some weird stuff going on with drugs and all kinds of other stuff, but listen, the stuff you see on TV is not real. <sighs> you were quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what, what, what got quickened? He says, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. All right, look, look at that air. Then he says, the spirit. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There's another spirit that's in men. But it's not God's spirit. And man's spirit's dead unless they're saved. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Amen. Look at, and Colossians, we're not going to go there for the sake of time. Colossians 2.13 says pretty much the same thing. So man is a tripart being. Elihu says there is a spirit in man. Yes, there is. And if they're not saved, it's a dead spirit. It needs to be quickened. Uh, and the way that happens is by the word of God. That's how that happens. By this book. You say, how, why is the Bible so important to you, Brother Tony? Because this book is the only thing that's going to quicken you. By the Holy Spirit of God. Psalm 119, verse 50 says, This is my comfort and my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Again, in, nine, in verse 93 of Psalm 119, I will never forget thy precepts, for with them thou hast quickened me. If you're saved this morning, it's because you heard the word of God. And the word of God came in, Hebrews chapter 4, and did an operation in your soul. 
this. We, we go to seed, we, 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 we're dogmatic on this because this is what does it. And if it's corrupted, you may not have it. If I cause you doubt because you read a new translation to get saved, then, then get it settled. Amen. Go to a King James Bible and get assurance. But uh, this is the book that does it. The Word of God. All right, you're dismissed.